Tom Clark's 6M Podcast is a Boink Studios production. And now, on with the show. Hey, hey, what is up? Welcome to Tom Clark's 6M Podcast. I'm your host, Tom Clark, and in this episode, I'm joined by co-host Phil Lindsay. Mutants abound in comic books. If you're a comic book fan, you know this very well. They've been a staple of the Marvel Universe for years since the 1960s. We'll get into that here today, a little bit of the history, and they will soon abound in the MCU, kids. That's right. Mutants are on the way. Deadpool is on the way to the MCU. Logan, also known as Wolverine, is on the way to MCU. It's happening. The movie's happening. It's going to be nuts. It's R-rated, supposedly. Can't wait to see it. Can't wait to do the 6M on that one. And a whole lot of other stuff mutant-related. As these moments come to pass in the great universe that we know as the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I'm not making any sort of comparisons this time. I don't want to you know, tiptoe around it. No need to slow dance. You know why you're here. We are reviewing the first X-Men film. Can't wait to get into this one. Let's get started here today. X-Men is a 2000 American superhero film directed by Brian Singer from a screenplay by David Hayter and a story by Singer and Tom DeSanto based on the Marvel Comics superhero team of the same name created by the great Stan Lee and the King Jack Kirby. The film features an ensemble cast, which we'll get in here to today, produced by Lauren Schuler Donner and Ralph Winter. It's attributed by 20th Century Fox, released on Ellis Island, actually. Nice little tie-in, July 12, 2000, and United States-wide release July 14, 2000. Total running time, 104 minutes. The budget for this film was $75 million. It made some bank, kids, $296.3 million, and that is your lowdown for X-Men. Phil, you and I talk comic books quite a bit. We've talked comic book properties quite a bit here on the 6M TV shows, movies, franchises, sequels, spinoffs, prequels, everything in between. I don't know how often we've talked about the original X-Men films. I'm looking forward to this. When was the last time you'd seen this movie? And does this movie still hold up for you now that we're 23 years after its initial release? I haven't seen this movie in years i can't think of the last time i've seen it um i think some of the stuff holds up very well um i do think that now that we've gotten in an era where we're kind of spoiled with so much um so much comic book properties and so much you know unabashed comic book um stuff i think this kind of it kind of stands out like a sore thumb now like you could tell at that time that you couldn't just go into into a studio and pitch a comic book movie and it was, it was a yes like it is now. Like they wouldn't just throw money at you like they would today. And you could see that watching this movie. Um, you could see how they had to um, kind of finesse it a little bit to get a studio to uh, come on board with it. And that sounds crazy because this is X-Men. This is one of Marvel's flagship properties. But 2000 is a different time than two in 2023 that's fair that's fair um my view is a little bit different i hated this no i'm kidding um i actually think it holds up pretty darn well there's a couple of one-liners that aren't working for me (laughs) the one-liner from storm about what happens when a toe gets struck by lightning i found to be a little weird there's a all-time bad movie line it's really bad right i hope i was hoping i wasn't the only one there's a couple of other things at uh, at times But for me personally, this movie really holds up, I guess because I went into it and tried to not think about the MCU, which is hard, right? But I went into it more along the lines of, okay, Tom, remember what year this was? Remember where your head was when this first came out? Phil, I'll tell you this, you know, and we've seen it with Captain Marvel, especially. Remember when the photo of her was released and the suit was green Mm -hmm. and everybody on the planet who had ever read a comic book lost their minds. Dude, they freaked out. They ran to Twitter. They ran to Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, 
you know, they sent smoke signals. This will be the worst movie ever made. She looks ridiculous. How can they screw this up? And everybody's like, it's one photo. Yeah, it's, it's, it was clear what they were doing with it from day one, too. When I saw it, I was like, no, she's dressed as a Cree. Because yes. the Cree wear green. I, I yes. knew that from the beginning. I'm like, anybody that reads comics, like, you know what a Cree soldier looks like. It's one photo. And that came to me today as I watched this. Uh, I remember when photos of this, of the characters, because they did full body shots of the actors in the suits. And my first thought in the year 2000 was not, wait a minute. This doesn't look like the X-Men. You know what I thought, Phil? I cannot believe we're getting an X-Men film. I was giddy like a kid, dude. I couldn't wait. Like, I had the complete opposite reaction that fanboys would have today when I saw the pictures. I'm like, I can't believe this is happening. I mean, in my wildest dreams as a kid, I could never have imagined. I imagined one hero, maybe, Wolverine one day, But Phil, they tackled, not for nothing, they tackled a cast of heroes here that each could have their own film. I mean, dude, do you think we can grasp the the immensity of this project for the year 2000? Do you think that anybody kind of appreciates how much they had to tackle for this movie? Yeah, that's why I I say that uh, it was just a different time in 2000. Uh, It is... It is pretty much, uh, it's impossible, I would say, to uh, discount what X-Men did for comic book movies. Um, and I, I mean, you can you can put MCU over here and say that what Marvel managed to do with their studios is different, but I don't think Marvel Studios is what it is without what uh, X-Men did in 2000 and what Spider-Man did in 2002. Um, that era of comic book movies it changed everything. It it made uh it made superheroes into the new blockbuster film. One hundred percent. And we had to give all due props for the Marvel side of this equation. We got to talk about Blade. Yeah. And 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 dude, you know we'd never covered that in the six M. We're gonna fix that. We're gonna cover that movie because I'm determined to. We just have not done it yet. Yeah, and I mean, Blade deserves the credit because it's one of the first that was actually really well done and was a good movie. But I think what X-Men and Spider-Man did is different because it, it it showed the studios how lucrative these characters were. And I mean, that's not to say that they didn't already know it was Batman and Superman, but I think this showed them like, no, there's real money in superhero films. Oh, 100%. And also, X-Men is a precursor to the first Tobey Maguire Spider-Man in 2002. Think about that. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Those movies made made billions. Yeah. And that's why I think now, I don't know if we, we have what Avengers was or what what ended up happening with like Iron Man and some of that stuff if those movies weren't successful. I don't think Iron Man happens. And I, I, I think if the MCU were to begin, it would not have been Iron Man. They would have picked a, a, a top-tier character because they would have been afraid it would have tanked. I think. Absolutely. Um, but I mean, their their options for which movies to go with would have been different as well. Because if X-Men True. tanked, then maybe Marvel ends up with the rights to X-Men back earlier Ooh. than they got them. Well, yeah, well said. You're right. And plus, not for nothing, Phil, but Stan Lee was selling property and the rights to produce characters anywhere he could across Hollywood just to yeah. get the, the movies and properties made, which I can't blame him, honestly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, when you look at like the last, well, you have to go a little bit further back, but for about the last two decades, um, Fox's slate of movies has been built around the X-Men universe. Mm. Good point. Yeah. Like not just their, I mean, their, their television department as well. They tried to give it a shot with gifted and I thought gifted was a great show. I did too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so they, a lot of the way they made money for the last two decades was based off of the X-Men franchise. Yeah. I really enjoyed gifted. Did it, did it go two full seasons? Yeah. It got canceled after the second season because Marvel studios, well, Disney bought um, Fox. So yeah, that's why it got canceled. I thought it was a good show. I did too. I imagine it wasn't cheap either. <laughs> no. I thought they had just gotten to a point where they were it, it was just finding 
like its its legs again. And I yeah. thought they had a really good cliffhanger to the last season. Unfortunate. I would like to see some of those characters come back in some way. Well, you know, dude, as we've seen with the Marvel Netflix universe, those characters are coming back and and the cool thing is, I know, dude, I say this all the time with this with this universe on this show, but Marvel tends to find actors with the right mindset. Now it doesn't hurt that they back the money truck up to their front door. I get it. <laughs> but, you know, I don't I don't recall them finding an actor with very few exceptions, like maybe perhaps the first James Rhodes. Uh, that perhaps thought they were bigger than this and just, (laughs) you know what I mean? Like I'm way too important to be doing this. I think nine times out of 10, they find people whose first response to getting cast is not, well, let me, uh, let me see what I can do with this role. No, the first response is I get to play who cool. Like to me, that's awesome. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I think Ed Norton tried to overstep his bounds a little bit too, but I agree. (laughs) But, um, it is what it is. I am one of those people that really enjoyed Ed Norton as Hulk, though. Yeah, same here. Same here. I think that he had the best of intentions, and I think, like, I don't know for sure, but it seemed as though he was, he wanted to take ownership of it and say, look, we can do more with this than just, you know, a paint-by-numbers comic book film. And I had, dude, I thought he was great in that movie. I thought the idea of him timing it with the watch and the last scene of him opening his eyes and they're green and he's smiling. I thought, oh my God, this is the best moment ever. That was very cool. Yeah. I, I would say that he's probably my favorite on screen Hulk. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Um, yeah, dude. And dude, speaking of Spider Man, I got to throw this at you. Have you, you seen the outtakes for this X Men film? Um, or have you? I don't think I have. Dude, you got to look this up. It's great. There's an outtake of the moment where they are on Ellis Island and the camera's stationary and, and they're, the X-Men are running toward the camera. And suddenly, in costume, runs someone dressed as Spider-Man. And he's running into the frame. And you can hear the cameraman start to laugh. And everybody stops. And James Marsden, no one knew whoever this guy was, was, was on set. And everyone just starts cracking up that there's Spider-Man on the set with the X-Men. And it's funny because two years later, we get Spider-Man. So I always thought that was a nice touch. And dude, as a fanboy, that outtake, which was nothing, and it was probably a gopher wearing the suit, like the guy that got them coffee or something. To me, that was like, I just saw Spider-Man on screen with Cyclops. This is the best day ever. Like, for me, that was cool, man. Yeah. So you got to check that out. Nice precursor. Um, speaking of the suits, before we dive into the cast, and again, Phil, we're considering this as the year 2000, and there's the great line in the movie, you know, where Wolverine complains about the suit, and Cyclops says, would you prefer yellow spandex? Nice little shout out to the books. What do you think about the biker suits that they're wearing in this movie? I think it worked at the time when you were still trying to open that door and get people to take these things seriously, Hmm. I think it works less today because now we see that it can work. Um, And we've seen where people can do the bright suits. We've seen Marvel Studios and other companies do very comic accurate suits. So now it's kind of like, yeah, I kind of want that. And like, yeah, that, that joke about the yellow spandex worked then. It was kind of like a tongue in cheek thing that was funny. But now it's like, yeah, I kind of do want the yellow spandex. Like, <laughs> at least try it. Like, of course. Yeah, dude. Why not? Right. The blue and yellow, the classic blue and yellow. Yeah, dude. Yeah. At least, at least try the brown. I think the brown will look good on, on a uh, screen. Uh, dude, who, whose run was it? Was it new X Men? I think Grant Morrison was the writer. I'm, I'm imagining the cover. I can't remember the artist. Oh, when they start wearing the leather jackets and stuff too. Yes, I kind of yeah, really like Grant that. Morrison. Yeah, yeah, they had like the ribbed uh, jackets and like the, the X shirts under. Yeah, yeah, that's Grant Morrison. I kind of really like that look too. Yeah, I think um, that was a cool look as well. But even that, they allowed it to have the bright yellow in there in in, in places. Very true. Very true. Um, well, let me ask you this because you you said this in the opening salvo here. And you're, to you, what is it about the movie that maybe doesn't hold up? What's some scenes or some lines? What do you think about it maybe doesn't hold up through the test? Is it just because of how far we've come or is there something else to it? 
Uh, I think it's still a very enjoyable movie. Um, hmm. I think the further we get away from it, I think some of the miscasting stands out more. Hmm. Um, Give me an example. That's, uh, like, I think Storm is terribly miscast. Thank you. Oh, dude, it was the first example I had. Absolutely. She, I think she's terribly miscast. And that's not a knock at Holly Berry as an no. actress. No. I just don't think she fits this role. Not I understand all. why that she was picked for the role, because they wanted a big name attached to it. Uh, but I just don't think she fits the role. Um, I think that what what she's given to do is not good either. The material she's given is not great. I think the wig they give her is awful. Yeah. <laughs> um, the line that is one of the worst lines in the movie is, is awful. I, I just think she's terribly miscast. I, I kind of think Anna Paquin is miscast as well. I think that Rogue mm. is is a more, much more interesting character than she was, than she was depicted in this movie. That's an interesting take on Anna because you kind of think, okay, Anna's my way in. That's what yes. you assume, but she's not. It's Logan. Logan's your way in, and you kind of think, well, the dudes whose body's covered in metal and has claws won't be my way in. It'll be this girl, but no, it's him for sure. Look, not for nothing. We know what she's went on to do, and at the time she was forty-two. But Angela Bassett is Storm. I'm sorry. Like, yeah, I, I think Angela Bassett would have been a better choice. I, I. I Hollywood has this weird affinity for not wanting to cast dark skinned women. Mm. And I think in this role, if you're going to cast someone that is like of African descent and not like an African American, that is like an African queen, (laughs) you should have gone with someone that looks like a native of Africa that has like an accent. um, And I would pick somebody that had a bigger build as well. Um, and I just still don't think they've gotten it right. Even when they recast Storm for the newer ones, I don't like that casting either. Um, I'm hoping that uh, they can fix that because I think uh, Black Panther has given me a lot of reason to be optimistic about them wanting to be, wanting to be authentic with uh, African culture and mm. cast more diverse women in these roles and not just go, hey, this is already a well-known Black actress Let's just put her in there. And that's why, again, I don't want to knock Holly Berry because she's she's fantastic. She's Oscar Oscar winner. She's had a great career, but I just don't think this was the role for her. Uh, agreed. I agree. Um, and, and watching it back, that was one of the first thoughts I had was, Holly Berry, that's right, Storm. Wow, why is she in this movie? Like, yeah. Because it, it feels like you cast her as the lead or the number two, not the number four. Or whatever it is, you know? Yeah. And I mean, don't get me wrong. There are there are roles that you could have given her in a in a comic book movie, and I think she would have knocked it out of the park. Yeah. I don't think this was it. No, I agree. And I think it's unfortunate that the two times that she has done comic book movies, that she's just been either miscast or put in a terrible movie. <laughs> And uh, let's see. I, I don't want to zip through the list, but Tyler Mayne and Sabretooth was miscast as well. I, I also agree on that. I, I think that they did a lot better with uh, with him in X-Men Origins, mm. even though X-Men Origins is not a very good movie. No. I think uh, I think that Sabretooth in that movie is much better. He's menacing. He, I feel like the, the rivalry between him and, and Logan feels real. Yeah. Um, they get a lot of like the dynamic between them right. And that is just not in this movie at all. Like Sabretooth is basically just like a walking henchman. He's essentially what Bane is in Batman versus Robin. I mean, Batman oh, and Robin. He's essentially yeah. the same. He's just a, a, a henchman that walks around. That's kind it. Of doofus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and let's be honest, the prosthetics, the makeup is not good. No, I, I think, and I think even the way he moves and everything looks clunky. Yeah. Um, I, I think they, what the the way he kills that guy on Ellis Island looks funny every time they show it. The way he just like picks him up and then he just goes limp and then he throws him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and they gave him a lion's growl. It's not even a mixed no, sound it, effect. Like it it's just, just a straight up lion's growl overdubbed. <laughs> it just yeah, it's not good. He, he doesn't he doesn't have a single line the entire movie. Does he? he? Doesn't. Um, no. Like we we have no idea of like why he has this obsession with with Wolverine. Like we have no idea of like what is their rivalry, and I think that is terribly missed here in this movie. Uh, mm-hmm. But again, I think they got that right in X Men Origins, even though 
there are other problems with that movie. <laughs> so many problems. Oh my God. So many problems. Speaking of uh, the cast, because I, you know, there's a lot to talk about here. The opening scene of this movie, rewind the clock, kids. Uh, you don't care about comic books, but your freaking kids have drug you to this thing and you did it because you love your kids. You don't want to hear them scream about it anymore. And the opening scene of this film, Phil, is unlike anything, I think, you know, besides besides Blade, obviously, that's a little bit different, but that's not what this is. This is mainstream comic book movie, not the off the beaten path. Mm -hmm. But the opening scene of this film is, you know, Nazi Germany, 1944. And dude, when this scene happens to this day, even watching it, I got a little choked up because it's such an emotional scene. It is effing fantastic. I love it so much because it absolutely sets the tone. And we eventually get Ian McKellen, Sir Ian McKellen as Eric Lyncher. And of course, Patrick Stewart is Professor X. How how important is it for this movie to nail the first scene? And why was it the best choice to lead off with this scene? I I, I think that it's it's a great way to juxtapose what happened to Eric as a kid and what some of the kids in the institute are facing and what like the main, I guess, like your viewpoint into the film is facing too and at a pack one because she's a kid too. Um, I think I think it's a good way to kind of show people like, hey, this is what was happening to him and this is why he is the way he is. This is why he is so militant about this. Um, and this is what could potentially face like kids now. And of course, I don't want to compare like a fictional fictional racism to what happened to to the Jews, but um, it is a nice juxtaposition. Yeah, and dude, I they they just they just nailed it. I mean, it looked real, it felt real. And dude, that scene where they knock the kid out and the soldier stands up and looks at that fence, that's one of the coolest things I've ever seen in a comic movie, even to the, even to this day. Yeah. I I I think they get the Magneto stuff um right for most of the movies. Even the movies I don't enjoy, I think that they get the dynamic with um Magneto well. Like I yeah. think I think the stuff they did in first class is amazing with Magneto. Yeah. I oh, think yeah. it's some of the best depiction of that character on on a uh, on the big screen. Hundred percent agree. Mike, Michael Fassbender is is uh, Magneto there. Um, why is why is Patrick Stewart? And look, from the moment the Next Generation hit the air, my friend, everybody and their brother, me included, said, "Oh my God, we found Professor X." I mean, dude, that's how this started. It wasn't, let's just find a bald guy. The moment that, that Next Generation started, it became, I think we found Professor X. And dude, so shall it became, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Why Why is he, in your opinion, why is he so unbelievably perfect as Professor X? I just think he, he I mean, he looks the part, but I think it, it also is that he brings dignity to the role. It doesn't just feel like, hey, it's a bald guy in a wheelchair. It feels like he brings like some legitimately to, legitimacy to the role. Um, I mean, you just buy into him in, in every role that he's in. When he's when he's given exposition, when he is, uh, he he seems sincere. He seems genuine. Everything you want uh, Professor X to be. Yeah, integrity, decorum. He he's professional actor like he could have turned actor. his nose up actor he could have turned his nose up at this comic book stuff like other people have done through the years yeah but this is a this is a career genre actor at this point very dude 100 percent. yeah i mean it, robert you know robert danny jr was born to play tony stark i think we both have agreed on that multiple occasions patrick stewart was born to play and i swear to god it's almost like they created the character for him like yeah. <laughs> It's yes. nuts. I like they're gonna have a tough time recasting because I I don't know how you do this without him. Like I feel like the the X Men franchise does not work without him. I mean, the Logan film does not work without him taking that risk and going that route with the role as well. And I don't think he gets enough credit for how good he is in Logan. Oh my God, he's so good in that film. Are you kidding me? 
He's so good in that film. I mean, you know, I don't know how soon we're going to see who we expect to see in the MCU. James McAvoy is 43 years old. Phil, if you really want to do the math, let's say that he's 45 by the time the X-Men get to the big screen. Dude, 45 with a shave head is plenty old enough. Perhaps. Perhaps. Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. They could maybe try to pass him off as older, or they just go, I think fans would be completely fine with him, but I don't know who else. Yeah, I, I kind of feel tough. like you got you to recast at this point. Mm. Um, I would like to see McAvoy come back because I enjoyed him in the role. Um, yeah. But I kind of feel like I kind of feel like they should go ahead and recast because I don't I don't know if you want to bring anybody from the first class films back other than him and Fassbender. I don't mm. know if it's really worth it. Well, that's a good point. Yeah, I don't know. Interesting question. Dude, what about this? And and this is not something new. This was said. This has been said, Phil, for years in the books, and you know this, that the comparisons and, and you know, Stan Lee doing what he could to bring – I guess, social issues to the books. But, you know, the whole mutant thing is metaphor for other issues, not the least of which uh, civil rights, African-American uh, issues here in this country. But this idea that Professor X is Dr. King and Magneto is Malcolm X. How much How much weight do you give that to this? Is it too much? Is it, it's just a silly comic book, but... Or, or is it enough for you in terms of this absolutely nails who these people are? I think on the surface, it's a it's a good way to describe their dynamic. Um, I think when you analyze that dy- their dynamic more after that, it kind of falls apart, especially with Magneto, because I think it paints an unfair picture of Malcolm. Because Malcolm wasn't a terrorist. Like, I mean, for better or worse, that's what Magneto is. Like, even... Even if you can empathize with Magneto and what makes Magneto such a, a great villain is that you can see his side. Uh, he's still a terrorist. <laughs> he's still, he still is a guy that wants to murder humans to make his point. Dude, that's, uh, that's actually, yeah, if you, if you turn it around and say, yeah, no, I get 100%. That makes a lot yeah. of sense. Yeah. And like, I, I think Malcolm de- believed in defending himself. I believe he defended and he believed in arming ourselves to defend ourselves and you can make it a, you can make a case that that's what uh uh magneto believed in as well but he also went pretty far with with this on several occasions in the comic books of trying to basically commit genocide and kill people <laughs> but he's a comic yeah. book villain so that's why I'm like I it I think it's a good description on surface but once you really delve into magneto as a character it kind of falls apart they even had um they had ian mckellen throw that line in at the end of the movie when he's locked up in the cell he said by any means necessary yeah i caught that and i i I have seen people say that they should cast uh, someone at black as magneto or someone black as professor xavier to to you know push that dynamic but i don't think they should i think Magneto is one of those characters that his his race is such a big part of his character that I couldn't see you taking away him being Jewish because it's such a big part of why his motivations and why he is the way he is. I actually really agree with that. And, you know, Phil, the shame of this recasting stuff is that, you know, when the Punisher finally made it to the big screen in a couple of regrettable movies, uh, you know what I mean? And one that was pretty good, uh, and a TV series as phenomenal at some point, Frank Castle can no longer have served in the Vietnam war. It, he just can't. Cause at this point he's 80, I guess if you yeah. did it today. So the, the pity of recasting this is if you set it to today's time, he can't have been in the concentration camps, dude, how, what, what, okay, hoy. What do you do then, Phil, to to nail this character's backstory if you can't have put him in a concentration camp in Nazi Germany? I mean, you could still, you could still make him Jewish, and you could still change parts of his backstory um, because there is there's still quite a bit of uh, 
discrimination against Jewish people to this day. Now, of course, mm. it's not as traumatic as concentration camps, but I feel like there's an interesting way you can tell that story. Yeah, I just wonder, would you know, would the dynamic change? Would he become a different type of character? I think you're right. There's enough there to make it work. Yeah, I and and you know, back to your point about why Magneto does not have to be African American. Uh, that's a bit on the nose at this point, wouldn't it be? It, it, it is. You see what I'm saying? Like we we've driven that point home as comic book fans for so many years. It's almost like, well, we don't need to do that really. Yeah, it is a bit too on the nose. And I, I do feel like, um, like I said, he's one of those characters where it feels like his race is important to his character. I'm not one of those people that feels like, oh, you can't change anybody's race. Yes, you can. But I do feel like it depends on the character and what their story is. Like Captain America is another one where a big part of his story is that he's white. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I, I don't know if you could write that same story and make him a black man. Um, And we've often said Bruce Wayne. Bruce Wayne's another one too. Yeah, it would make sense for him because he comes from old money dating back to the Civil War maybe in this country. Yeah. Yeah. And I think his his dynamic just changes if you make him black. There are other characters like that too, but I, I do think people get so caught up in this. Don't change anybody's race. Why are you doing this for woke reasons? Which, boy, if I could get people to stop using that word at this point, you're using it incorrectly. <laughs> I don't want to go into a rant, but the the <laughs> where where the word woke came from and the way you're using it, you're using it wrong. It's one of those things that you took from black people. You don't know why black people were using it, and you're 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 misusing it. <laughs> Just stop it. <laughs> yeah, like the word Karen. Yeah, yeah. Same thing, right? Um, yeah, and it's it's you know that's a whole other topic because you and I have covered that quite a bit here, like. Oh man, this is kind of, it's related, but it's not exactly the same thing. Uh, My wife and I were watching something, I forget what it was, and it was one of these sitcoms, and it, like, you know who the main character is, you know who his best friend is, you know who the love interest is, and you know who the homosexual character is, because he's overtly, outwardly flamboyant. Yeah. He's outspoken. He snaps when he talks. He says girl quite a bit. <laughs> and I'm like, man, this, and like, I'm not one of those people who like you, who says, well, you, can, you can't we'll change. what I don't care about that. It doesn't really matter to me. If it fits, it fits. I don't care. Make him or her, whatever you want to make them. But like, it's almost like that there is, there's a quota now that you have to hit this. You got to check this box, check that box. And like, why don't you just do what's best for the story? Like if, if the story calls for everyone in the cast to be a certain color. Okay. If, if they're all supposed to be a certain persuasion. Okay. I I just, and you know, who am I to say, you know, I'm not the guy writing this stuff, but it's like, if you're going to have the character, why does the gay character again have to be, you know, flamboyant? Can he just be like a normal guy? Why does the black character have to be tough or have gold chains around his neck. Why does the white guy have to be kind of a doofus and quirky? What? What? Like, dude, it's almost like there's roles that you put, you know, actors of ethnicities in, and that's where they plug them in. Like it's a, I don't know. Like it's an, I don't know. <laughs> it's hard to explain. Yeah. Like a Lego set. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, they definitely have like the stereotypes and archetypes for these characters. Um, yeah. And I don't, I don't mind the way they've changed characters. I don't mind. Um, the way that they've made a point of adding more gay characters to things, because sure. that's just the world we live in, and it, it, it needs to be normalized in storytelling, because the last thing we want is, is stuff where it's just from the perspective of one set of people, because that's just not reality. Yeah, you're right, 100%. Uh, not reality at all, actually. Um, we've covered the top two in this film. we got to talk about the man. And again, Phil, I, I, I've beaten this like a drum on the 6M. Someone who's born to play a part. Dude, when I was a kid, we were fantasy casting Wolverine. And it it was uh, Glenn Danzig was like my top choice because he looked like him. He was the right height. He had a great speaking voice. He had a good look. He had intensity. He was a huge comic book guy. I think he wanted the part. Don't know if he could act at all, but fans wanted him. 
And then it became, well, you know, Wolverine's short. Hey, Danny DeVito's short. And I'm like, excuse me? And then it became Bob Hoskins. Bob Hoskins is short and he's a really good actor. I'm like, he is a really good nah. actor. But but Wolverine, really? No. Nah. So, yeah. And, I, you know, for years we said, well, you can't cast a guy that's six foot tall as Wolverine. It doesn't make any sense. That's not the book. And then, you know, push came to shove and they said, look, we can't find a guy that's 5'3". And it's ripped and they can act, I suppose. So let's find this dude named Hugh Jackman, who, by the way, Phil, as you know, was not the guy that initially got this part. That was going to someone else. But Hugh Jackman's who we got. But again, Phil, someone that's bored to play Wolverine. I mean, and now he's coming back, which is nuts. He's 81 now and he's coming back. No, but uh, he said he wouldn't do it. And now he's back for Ryan Reynolds' sake. Dude. What can we say about Hugh Jackman as Wolverine that we haven't already said here before? How great is he in this movie, honestly? He's great. Um, I think he looks the part. Um, he, he he just brings something to the role. It just I, I, it just wouldn't have worked without him. I mean, from the very first time we see him and he, he has his back to us and he's, he's, he's uh, drinking in that cage and you just see him smoking the cigars. It's great. He just brings... <laughs> he brings this... Uh, I, I don't want to say charisma because the word is overused to death, <laughs> but he just brings this energy to the role that I don't know if anybody else could have done it justice. Um, and I mean, it, it, it almost is to the detriment to the franchise that it, he was as good as he was because he became the star of the franchise and everybody else kind of became supporting roles for him. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's hard. It, it's not hard to see why the studio looked at this thing. It was like, this is the guy. This is the guy you built the franchise around because he was just that good in the first movie. He was. I mean, his performance, like I said earlier, dude, we all kind of thought Anna Pack would be your way in. She's not. It's Logan, which is nuts um, for a lot of reasons. I can't pinpoint exactly why, it, like, why couldn't it have worked? It absolutely works. He's your way in. And to put this into um, perspective here, kids. Glenn Dadzig wasn't actually invited, but he couldn't make it because of uh, touring conflicts with his band. And Phil, if I'm Glenn Dadzig, I said, guys, I'll be back in an hour. I'll be back next week. Carry on without me. Put a tape recorder in my place. I'm going to go <laughs> audition for Wolverine. Like what? So he said, no. Uh, uh, Brian Singer wanted Russell Crowe. Russell Crowe said, no. Singer brought in Viggo Mortensen, but Mortensen's son, I never knew this, was vocal about the character's imposing appearance. And also, Mortensen didn't want to sign on for multiple films. The role of Wolverine was given to Dugray Scott. He was the villain from Mission Impossible 2, and that's one of the reasons why I couldn't do it. And also, the way I recall this, he bowed out at the last second because he broke one of his arms while filming for that movie. So they had to replace him. And then Hugh Jackman was the guy three weeks into filming. Phil Crazy. came in, nailed the audition and got the part. Yeah. I, I think he nails everything you need. I mean, when mm -hmm. you need him to do the feral parts where he is just like going ballistic, he, he does that perfectly well. When he, when you need him to be uh, surly and, and likable at the same time, he does all that stuff. Well, He's just great. He he, he nails the character. There's, I I don't think that you could have done any better casting this role. No. And Dick Ray Scott's a good actor, but I just can't. And you know what? Maybe he wouldn't nailed it. But looking back, I don't know how you do. Like you said, I mean, he's great. Everything he does, you're right. Everything that he needs to do um, is great. When they're in the truck and she looks at his hand and she goes, does it hurt when they come out? And he goes, every time. I yeah. thought, I thought, dude, is this a comic book film? This is great. <laughs> yeah. Well, you need him to, to be like brave and like this, this like guy with an edge with a heart of gold. He nails all of that stuff. He, he, he makes you believe in all of it, but then yes. it, he, he has his other parts where he could be just as surly and, 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 and a loner as, as you want this character to be. Um, it's great. I mean, at the, <laughs> I, I think there are several parts, like we were saying, that there are lines that don't work. Um, 
there are several lines that shouldn't work that he makes work. Mm. Um, like off the top of my head when he's in the in the room and he he he's like trying to put on the ladies' man and trying to woo uh Gene and he's like and, and Scott's at the door and he's like, This is the part where you tell me uh stay away from your girl. <laughs> that shouldn't work, but he he makes it work because he's yes. so good in that scene. And that's that's uh credit to James Martin as well, because James Martin did so well in that scene as well. So good. Well, if I had to tell you that, she wouldn't be my girl. So good. Oh God. Such a great comeback. Um <laughs> such a great comeback. Dude, we'll get to him. I can't wait to get to him. Because talk about a guy that had to hold his own against effing Wolverine. Are you kidding? Uh, he freaking did it. Yeah, it's so many lines are good. So many lines that work. Uh, the cage fight at the beginning, when the promoter tells the guy, he says, "Don't." He says, "Don't kick him in the balls." And he says, "Don't you say anything goes." He it does. Anything does go, but he'll take it personal. <laughs> it's so good, man. Yeah. Oh my uh, god. It just, just how short he is with people like when he gets in the when he kicks rogue out of the out of the car and she's like i saved your life no you didn't <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> and then he sees her in his rear view and he's like ah so he stops the car that's very much wolverine's cantankerous attitude where he doesn't like to be around anybody that's exactly him they nailed it yeah and that i mean i feel like they they did this dynamic that he's had several times in the comic with uh, having a, a young woman that he sees as like a mentee in some ways. So he, he has that dynamic with Jubilee in, mm. the, in the cartoon. He has it with other other girls in the throughout the franchise. Um, and so that part of it works. I still think that the way they use Rogue in this movie is just, just not right for that character. I think that worked for somebody like Kitty Pride or somebody else, but not so much for Rogue. Mm. Yeah, I agree. And dude, is it me or the moment that he and uh, Famke Jens are on screen at the same time? Can you not just feel the freaking chemistry between these friggin' actors in this movie? Can you not just feel it? Yeah, I think the love triangle stuff works because the three (laughs) of them are just so good. Yeah. God, it's almost like the, the scene, not like in a dirty way or something, but like the scene just heats up the moment they're on camera for the first time, you're like, man, are these two dating in real life? Cause it kind of feels like they're very familiar. Like, yeah, whew, really good stuff, man. Um, yeah, he's, uh, he's way too tall for this Phil. My God, this Hugh Jackman guy. <laughs> uh, what was the movie? Was it, uh, what was the film? Was it a national treasure? Not national treasure, but a uh, ninth museum film, I think where he's on stage. I think. And it was, uh, yeah, he, he goes into berserker rage. He's like, what are you doing? Yeah. I forget what movie that is. They call him huge Ackman, huge Ackman, huge Ackman. Uh, yeah, this huge Ackman guy. I don't know, Phil, he is, this kid looks like he might be going somewhere. Good for him. (laughs) So, uh, (laughs) yeah, dude, he's, I mean, he's phenomenal. He's, and you know what? It's the kind of guy that, I, like if you met him in real life, I don't know that you'd be starstruck. He just, God, he just seems like Brad Pitt's the same way that just the demeanor they have that just seems like, you know, like, like, I don't know, like he's classy, he's smart, um, intelligent guy, but like, he just seems so down to earth and so normal. Like, I mean, Wolverine can't be unapproachable. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, he has to be every man, but he also has to have a chip on his shoulder. He has to have a past. Like, being able to play this kind of character and pull it off cannot be the easiest thing in the world, you know? Yeah, I, I think it's a, I think it's a challenging role. And I think, because it's not just that you have to be able to act well. Of course, you've got to be in fantastic shape. And he is mm. in fantastic shape in this movie and gets in even better shape later throughout the franchise. Um, yeah uh and, and so you gotta be in fantastic shape and then you've also got to be able to bring like this gravitas to this role um probably even more so than some of the other cast members other than maybe magneto yeah yeah for sure and i remember ian mckellen i remember reading that he wore a, a, a bodysuit for his upper torso so it gave him square shoulders and gave him a little bit more pronounced of a figure so he wasn't 
not a frail old man. That's not the right way to put it. But, you know, he looked a little bit more physically imposing than what he actually was. So when you see him in the suits and the trench coats, that he's wearing a piece underneath. So, Yeah. I really like Ian McKellen in the role as well. I think he's... So good. I, I, I think it would have been easy for me to be like, oh, well, bring this like tall and imposing guy in. But I think Ian McKellen brings something to the role that you just can't beat it. I mean, it's, it's if you got Ian McKellen here and he wants to do something, you're not going to go, ah, nah, we'll, we'll find somebody else. <laughs> the fantastic actor. Fantastic actor. And if he wants to do your movie, if he's not right for the part, then you write a part for him because that's how good he is. Like you, you don't not put him in your movie. Like, yeah. yeah. But, but to your point, he's, he's great. They nailed. I mean, <laughs> No wonder this movie worked, Phil. No wonder it spawned how many sequels and another universe and different actors down the road. And that they kept going back to this and the original actors were still around because they just nailed it. They nailed all three of these roles, which is just crazy to me. I mean, you should be so lucky. I don't, and look, look, can we call this what it is? The next time we saw a superhero team really get nailed to this point, it was the Avengers, wasn't it? Yeah. Because you can't really count Fantastic Four, honestly. <laughs> you can, I guess, but... I I think they had bits and pieces of it right the first time around. I think they yeah. cast a very good Reed. I think they cast a good Ben Grimm. And I think they even had a good Johnny. I think Jessica Alba is the only one that didn't quite work. And Victor Von Doom. Yeah, and Doom, of course. But... Yeah. And it's not that they cast the wrong guy as Doom. That guy's not a bad actor, but no, boy, he's not. not that just what they decide to do with the character. Just no. Oh, it's terrible. So bad. No, it's another podcast. But yeah, I, I, for my money, pound for pound, I don't think they nailed a movie like this again until the Avengers film. I think they just. And Phil, think about this. They took several movies to get to that, and this movie was done in one, like. This is the kind of movie you kind of expect to happen now. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like where a studio would roll the dice now, but in 2000, when none of these characters had ever been on screen ever, like it, I'm sitting here knowing that I was alive when this freaking movie came out. Uh, and, and it still blows my mind that this thing ever made it to the screen to begin with. It's crazy. Yeah. Crazy. Let's talk about Dr. Jean Grey, Famke Jansen. Again, Phil, um, I think she's great in this. We don't have anything to, to really compare to and no disrespect against any of the writers that wrote the character, because depending on who the writers are in question and the artists in question, she was either portrayed as the damsel in distress, you know, cookie cutter character, or she was great with a very distinct personality. But Famke Jansen is no damsel in distress. She's strong. She's intelligent. She nails this part. Um, and again, her and and Hugh Jackman work so well together in this movie. Talk about Famke Jansen as as Doctor Jean Grey. What do you think? I think she's great. I think um, I think one of the downsides to this X Men franchise is I don't think we get enough of her, and I, mm. I feel the same way about Marston as well. Um, I feel like once it became the Wolverine show, it was just like they their their parts to play in the movie. Um, fell to the wayside, and I think that's a shame. Mm. But I think she was very well cast. Oh well, you know, I mean, if you don't like the way what happens here, just wait till X Men Three when they suddenly turn uh, heel for heel for no good reason. Uh, <laughs> X Men Three is such a bad movie. It's Jesus such Christ. a bad movie. Look how far we fell. Such like a the bad, first bad movie, very bad. The first two Spider Man are exceptional. Two better than one, you could argue. First two X Men, you could argue X two better than X one. Then you get to part three of both franchises. You're like, wait a minute, <laughs> what? X X Men three is one of the few movies that at the time made me angry enough that I wanted to leave the theater. Oh wow! And I've I've that rarely happens. Um, I've sat through some bad movies. I sat through Last Airbender, not a good movie. Oh man! <laughs> sat in the theater for Superman Returns as well. Not a great movie. At least it was entertaining. X-Men 3, hated it. 
I mm. I despise that movie. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a tough tough watch, and I think I've seen it twice. Honestly, I saw it in a the theater, and because I because DVDs when it came to DVDs and comic book movies, I bought everything. I did buy it, I think, and I think I watched it one time, and that was like not long after it was released on DVD. I just don't. I have no interest in watching it again, honestly. Yeah, very bad movie. <laughs> very bad movie. <laughs> but uh, I don't mean to skim over her, but I want to talk about her chemistry with James Mars. And as we know, Scott Summers slash Cyclops. Um, he's great. He's great, Phil. He's the pretty boy. He's cocky. He's a little arrogant. Looks like he's got everything handed to him. Uh, he's he's typical clean cut, clean shaven but he's the team leader. Of course he is that kind of thing. But dude, there is a, there's an edge to him that I didn't expect. And after rewatching this after a very long time, that edge is really there. Like he's not really threatened by Logan. It's almost like the way he looks at Logan. It's almost like he's thinking, I've seen this before. I've seen your kind before. You're not scaring me. Like, dude, he's never scared of this guy, ever. Like, ever. when Logan first puts his hands on him, he just looks over his shoulder at the professor like, what do you want me to do here, boss? Never, <laughs> never flinched, not once. <laughs> never, not once. Um, yeah, I think James Marsden was perfectly cast here. I, I I think he looks the role. He's tall. He's believable as a leader. Um, when, you, when they gave him moments where he actually got to do um, cool stuff, he does cool stuff. Um, when he, when he gets to moat, um, when he's in a scene where, uh, Professor X is laid out on, on, and he's like, um, taught me everything that's worth knowing. And he gives that whole, I'll, I'll take care of everything. If you, if you don't make it, it's everything you want Scott Summers to be. Hmm. Yeah. He's perfect. He, he nails it. He absolutely gets it. Yeah. And he, he never feels like. He never feels like a boring Boy Scout in this movie. And I think that's what some people saw Cyclops as for a long time. And I've always been a bigger Cyclops fan than Wolverine. I know I'm a rarity in comic book fans because everybody thinks Wolverine's the cool one. I've always liked Cyclops more. Um, And I kind of feel like he doesn't get his due in the movie franchises either. I feel like he's such a better character than we got throughout this franchise, but I think this was a great introduction to him. Mm. Yeah, he's, uh, um, he's great. He holds his own. He, he and her look good together. They look like they fit. Yes. And he's, even though she and Logan don't look like they fit, they feel good together. Like it feels real, but Cyclops and Jean feel like they fit. And also, like I said earlier, you needed a guy that could, you know, counter, for lack of a better term, Jackman's animal magnetism. Dude, this guy did it. Like, I don't know how he did it, but when they shared the screen together, I think it's pretty even, dude. Yeah, um, there are several scenes where you expect him to just kind of cower and back down, and he's just kind of looking around like, no, you're in my domain. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is my team, like basically no you're out of your depth here <laughs> and professor x is in that scene telling them who who they are and he's a he's like saber tooth he's like you know storm cyclops and he goes what do they call you wheels such a good moment and that shouldn't have worked and it works and then when he goes up to cyclops hey pal you want to get out of my way when he grabs him like it's so good so good yeah um I've had very few moments where I jumped out of my seat and wanted to applaud. But at the end of Days of Future Past, when Wolverine walks in and he sees Jean for the first time and he wants to hug her, and Scott shows up out of nowhere and he goes, I thought I told you, stay away from my girl. Such a great moment. <laughs> it's just such a great moment to see Marston again. And I just think he's such a great Cyclops man. If When they do X-Men again, I really want them to nail Cyclops. I really want him to get what Captain America got. Because I feel like there was a perception for a long time that that Captain America was kind of lame. And I think the movies changed that. I think his trilogy changed that viewpoint. And I, I really want Marvel to do that for Cyclops. 
Mm. I think it can happen. Um, I, you know, my fear is that while I sit here and applaud MCU with good reason, I believe personally, while I applaud them for making excellent casting choices, I do fear with the whole new X-Men team, you know, with the more casting choices to make, the more possibility there is to get it wrong. I'm not Mm -hmm. trying to be negative here, but, um, I don't know, Phil, if I'm going through my head today of actors who are about the right age, either now or two years from now, dude, I don't know where I even begin to cast a new X-Men film, man. Yeah, I think, I really think they should start with the original five if they do another movie. Um, Mm -hmm. I know that temptation is there to go and recast Wolverine and do the Wolverine stuff again, but I think it's so important to start with the original five. Um, and at least get those five characters right first. Mm. That way there's an affinity for those characters before you add Storm and some of the other characters. Um, Because I think that's part of the detriment of this movie is that you're not introduced to Cyclops and Jean first. You're not introduced to any of those these other characters first. You're introduced to Wolverine first. And he just always seems so much cooler than everybody else. Yeah. And so because of that, it, it makes it feel like, no, this is the Wolverine movie. This is the Wolverine show. It's Wolverine and the X-Men. <laughs> Wolverine and the X-Men. Good call. Yeah, just like the, the cartoon they, they sure. made, uh, which yeah. was a good cartoon, by the way. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, it just sounds like a, uh, a 50s group. You know what I mean? Wolverine yeah. and the X-Men. All right. Yeah, it's not a... It's a David Ruffin and the Temptations, not the Temptations. Yes. <laughs> I was going Glass Night in the Pits, but yours makes better sense. No, it's a, it's a, if, if you've ever seen a Temptation movie, which is a classic, they play it all the time. Yeah. But David Ruffin in that movie, Leon is David Ruffin in that movie, is incredible. What a, He's very what, good. Yeah. <laughs> it's incredible. I, I watch that movie all the time. And every time I watch it, I do the entire rant he does when he talks about, man. <laughs> Y'all need me. <laughs> Without me, y'all some fake temps. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that was like a VH1 film, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a made-for-TV like miniseries. Um, yeah, I thought so. Yeah, but it, it's so good. That in the Jackson movie they made for TV is just so good. Uh, the Beach Boys film they made wasn't bad either. Uh. I remember one of the Beach Boys actually played Peter Tork in the Monkeys movie they did as well. Yeah. Um, I don't know how yeah. I that. Which, off off topic. Finally watch this Elvis movie, by the way. Very, oh my God, movie. I got to hear this. Tell me. Pretty good movie. I told you. Uh, there are some inconsistencies here. There are things that I'm like, ah, you could have covered that a little bit better. But I'm not this huge Elvis fan, so I'm not going to sit here and gripe about it. You don't want to watch it again, do you? Um, no, I think it's an enjoyable movie. I I would watch it again. I I didn't find it not enjoyable. I just can't watch it again because like, you know, unless you're him, you don't really know. Although there's been plenty of stories through the years of this, you know, him going through depression and, and, you know, couldn't get away from the Colonel. That was a very real thing. Dude, it's such a drag of a film. I just can't, I don't think yeah. I could watch it again. Yeah. There are parts of it that are very sad. Um, yeah, some of the stuff that he, the real life stuff with him is pretty sad. Um, but I mean, very rarely do we get biopics about any of these musicians and it has a happy ending. Oh, it's very true. Except, uh, walking tall. Yeah. I mean, there are some like, uh, Ray had a happy ending, but there is some very dark tall. stuff in it. <laughs> Not walking tall. Uh, 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 walk as, um, walk the line. Oh, walk the line. Um, you yeah, you're talking about the, the Dewey Cox. <laughs> What that's uh that's Walk Hard. Uh Walking Tall is the I'm sorry, that's the, the rock that's, movie where he's the the he has like the two by four. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. In the original movie, the character's name was Buford Pusser. <laughs> what a name. It's the truth. It's the truth. The original Walking Tall, the character's name was Buford Pusser. Yeah. Well wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Jeez. Uh, how do we get off on all that? I don't even remember. Uh, yeah, but... <laughs> we got in the biopic somehow. <laughs> yes, yes, yes.
crossing the uh, pop culture lines and references as we often do here on the show. But yeah, I, I again, I was surprised that Morrison had such an edge. I love that he did. I thought it fit. Rebecca Romain, uh, formerly known as Rebecca Romain Stamos as Mystique, all we've heard for 23 years is, dude, she was naked. Dude, she was totally naked. She was completely naked. Oh my God, she was so naked. <laughs> and I'm th- I'm thinking, why though? Like, yeah. like why? Like, I know the explanation is number it's it's two pronged in my opinion. One, she didn't need clothing. No. And if she had clothing, the clothing probably couldn't change appearance with her. Right. But number two, she's a mutant and she doesn't need clothing. And she doesn't really care if you don't like it because she she's past the point of caring. Like yeah. she delivers that line that, you know, it's people like you. I was afraid to go to school as a child. So like at this point, she doesn't care what you think. But dude, yeah. Phil, she's totally naked. Like this is so unnecessary, period. It, it, like I get it, but dude. It, it, it's kind of it's kind of over the top. Um, yeah, I, I enjoy her a lot in this movie. Um, I do really like the idea of Mystique having basically like snake skin or like a reptile skin so when she changes it's like it has like a it has like a tie to like actual nature like she's like camouflaging herself mm-hmm. yeah and so i do like that idea of it. and when i first saw it i was like oh that's kind of genius to do that with her skin um but it is very like gratuitous and i feel like it got more and more ridiculous um throughout the franchise by the time we got the first class and you got uh, Jennifer Lawrence also doing the makeup, and it's it's just kind of ridiculous. Um, there's the scene in in first class where she's a kid and she's naked. And it's like, but why? Yeah. It's it's yeah yeah. Why? It, it just got a uh, it got a little bit ridiculous, but the concept in itself is is cool, and I I understand why you used it for this movie. Um, I would have liked maybe I'm not saying that you should put her in the cloak and the skulls and stuff like the comic. But, you know, at least try to modernize her look at it or do something else. Um, I'm interested to see how they're going to use Mystique if they try to use Mystique later on, because a big part of pop culture only knows her this way. That's a very good point. Tom Clark 6M Podcast is sponsored in part by Radius Law Group. Every day, Radius helps individuals, families, small businesses, and nonprofit organizations throughout North Carolina, Florida, and Pennsylvania resolve their legal issues by providing effective legal counsel in the areas of estate planning, as well as elder law and Medicaid. Radius Law holds the radical belief that working with a lawyer can indeed be enjoyable. So give them a call at 1-800-519-5667 for more information and tell them that Tom Clark 6M Podcast sent you. Like we knew her as Nightcrawler's mom. That's how we knew her. Yeah, they never discussed that at all in this movie. We don't know her as Nightcrawler's mom or Rogue's mom. Very true. Yeah. Um, you know, again, different time, and even for the year two thousand, she's completely naked. Like, I, you know, I, I don't know. Like, uh, and even like, I don't care about it because I'm a guy. I just. I don't know. As a comic book fan, I'm just like, she doesn't have to be naked. I don't know why we feel the need. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's a I, I think it's it's a cool visual for this movie. I think sure, the way yeah. they used her and um in the fight scene, she's great. I think the the main fight scene she does with, with uh Wolverine at the Statue of Liberty is still cool. Mm-hmm. Um like I, you just can't beat some of this stuff like her doing a spin kick in midair and transforming midair into it still looks awesome. Yeah. Um, and I think she is even cooler in the second movie when she has like that, uh, the scene where she lets herself get captured and she takes down all the guys and slides out of there. Um, it's great, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that visual definitely got old after a while. It got a little stale after a while. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. Um, let's see. Bruce Davison as Senator Robert Kelly. Look, you need a white-haired white dude to play a politician that doesn't really understand, and he's just trying to keep his his wacky, probably racist constituents happy. You got the right guy. Bruce Davison's a really good actor. Let's give credit where credit's due. 
Um, really good actor. He's done some really good stuff through the years. I thought he was great here. He didn't have yeah. a major part, but Phil, you had to hate this guy and or at least be against him. Dude, he nailed it, you know? Yeah, I think Senator Kelly, Kelly was a good character to use for this. Mm-hmm. And I, th- I thought he did well in the role. Um, every time I think of X-Men films now and I think of just like where we are as real world, like when you look at Mike Pence, he looks exactly like one of those senators that would be against the mutants. He, yeah. <laughs> he, yeah. he looks the part, like everything about him. And, you know, I, I think we, I think you just touched on something by casting the X-Men now. Then you're, you're perhaps going off different themes as well. You know, it's not just white and black. It's not just, I look different, but dude, it's now I am different. I don't fit. I'm an outcast. People look down on me because I'm different. Like, yeah. Dude, there's there's a whole other subtext to this franchise now. Doing it either this year, next year, the year after, whatever. Like it's it's just it it starts to take to take on somewhat of a different meaning, you know? Yeah, for sure. Um for sure. I think there are so many analogies that you could make to racism and discrimination with X Men. Um I think that's part of why it's such a great property and why it's had such staying power. Um, yeah. I think that the scenes they did with those hearings early in the movie between him and Gene were really good. I think he does a great job of um, really selling, driving home why people would be afraid of the mutants. Yeah, for sure. And like, they look like everybody. They, they you know what I mean? They, unless it's Mystique, unless it's Toad, unless it's Sabretooth, but like for the most part, they look like normal people. And like, what wasn't it that Stanley at one point said that the reason he decided to create mutants was that having to come up with ways that that characters got their powers was getting boring. It was starting to run out of ideas. So he was like, oh, I got an idea. Let's just say they were born this way, <laughs> which is yeah. great, actually. Makes sense. <laughs> yeah, because only so many radioactive spiders lurking around, kids. I'm just saying. Yeah. So yeah. And like Henry Gyrick got like two minutes in this film in the chopper and it wasn't even him. It was Mystique. Yeah. Henry Gyrick is a, a pretty notable X-Men villain. Yeah. Ray Park is Toad. We know him as the original Darth Maul. They had to give him a scene where a staff and he was in a Darth Maul pose. And it obviously it was intentional. And they had a bit of fun with it. I don't know if he's perfectly cast here. I would suspect not. But I thought it was fine. He's very um, athletic and probably rarely ever used a stuntman. So, like, yeah, I thought he was fine here, man. I really I really enjoy him. I think yeah. just how weird he is and just how quirky he is is, is fun. Um, I think that he is jobbing big time in that in that Statue of Liberty fight. That fight should have been over in minutes. He doesn't stand a chance against Storm, but we got to make it believable for this movie. And <laughs> I mean, you got to make it believable that three X Men are having a hard time with this guy, and all three of these X Men are way more powerful than him. So, <laughs> that's one of my nerds. That isn't believable at all. Storm could have just gusted <laughs> him out of out of the building and blew him away, <laughs> or. Um, uh, Cyclops could have ended this fight a long time ago, but it's a movie. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So Sean Ashmore, we got to give a shout out to is Bobby Drake slash Iceman. He plays a bigger role down the road, but we see him here. And I thought he was, again, I thought he was really good for what they gave him to do. I thought it was fine. I didn't see any issues with him at all. Good looking kid. Makes a lot of sense for Iceman. And again, he gets the, you know, especially next to dude, when the mansion, when they storm the mansion. Oh my God. Like what a moment that is. Yeah. Um, X-Men 2 is just a better movie in every way. It, just, it is it, such it, a good film. It, it's everything. It, it feels like this movie was the pitch to get in the door. And then X-Men 2 was all of the cool stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 X-Men go. Don't, the only thing that was missing in X-Men 2 was Sentinels. That was the only thing that would have made it like perfect. Everything I wanted. Um, yeah, I, I 
I think he is fine as Iceman, but it's hard to get past. Like, I feel like Iceman is it's the same that I feel about Rogue, where Iceman is just such a better character than what we get in this movie. But for yeah. the role that he's playing in this movie, he works fine. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Um, and his brother has been in Hollywood for a while, too. So there's that little connection as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm with you. I I I agree. It's um um that he could have had uh, more to do, and he has something to do later, which is cool. So yeah, I, a, another one of my nerd gripes when I first saw it, I was like, why is Iceman a student? Why isn't he presented as an equal with Gene and Cyclops? He was in the same class as they were. Right. Yeah. He's one of the original five. Why isn't he treated like one of the original five? And also, yeah, good point, actually. And also, um, you know, we said the budget for this film was $75 million, and the movie makes like almost $297 million. Well, when the first one's that much of a hit, the second one, the budget is one hundred and ten to $125 million. Yeah, yeah. Now we've got... <laughs> Now we've got the budget to do some bigger things. Um, and I mean, I'm not sure how well you would have made Iceman work in the first movie on that budget. Um, the, all of the cool things you do with, you could do with Iceman, you wouldn't have been able to do with that budget and the technology at that time. Very true. Dude, I actually thought Davison's the way he died in this film was, was I don't want to say hard to watch because it's CG, but man, it was kind of gruesome because like, like you're seeing him breathe out, like it's his last breath, and it's just oh, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, like he's like drowning at yes. the same time, and yeah, it is very graphic. Ooh, I didn't recall it being that intense. I guess I just at the time was had become immune to it because I've seen it so many times. But it's been years since I've seen this film, so it's like oh my god, I've forgotten it being that intense. So. Before we get to this story, man, why does Anna Paquin not work for you as Rogue? Why? Why is it? Why is that the case for you? Yeah, I, I, I think the Rogue that I was introduced to as a kid. If you were a guy that watched the the '90s cartoon, and you're seeing Rogue do all this cool stuff like fly and like punch out a sentinel and always be so self assured and so cool, and you see her as kind of like this meek and quiet teenager, it's like ah. Uh, no, that's not really the character. Mm-hmm. And I understand why they, they went that route with the character because this is somebody in real life that could not touch anyone. So, of course, they would be reserved um, until they got around more people like them that understood them. Um, right. But I just think for this movie and some of the action set pieces you could have done with Rogue, I think that it's just kind of a miss. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not gonna say that I've, I think she was miscast. I think there was. I don't know if I'll say that. I personally that I'll say she's miscast. I'll say that they could have done better, in my opinion. But that's I, not to say that I think that she shouldn't be here. I just don't know, like you, if it's a great fit. Yeah, I don't. I don't think she's a great fit in the in in the role that they want her to be in this movie. Um, and that's not that's not a knock on Anna Paquin. It's just kind of that this is just it just doesn't feel like Rogue. <laughs> it doesn't. Yeah, you're right. Um, I just feel like they could have done better with the character. But I feel like there are quite a few characters that end up like that way in, in the X-Men franchise where they're just kind of there in passing. It's like, oh, but this character is really cool and we don't really see any see them do anything. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um I got to talk about this story because we spent a whole lot of time on the cast, which is perfectly understandable, but the story is great. I think because it, it touches on so many things, not the least of which are the, you know, the, the elements of, you know, real life, you know, racism and people being different and people being, you know, looked down upon because of their, their different. And, you know, it's all behind this, this thin veil of comic book superpowers, which, you know, Stan Lee was also making a statement in those books that, you know, it's not, not right to persecute people for the fact that they're different than you are. And so again, thinly veiled, which I like, but also this idea, Phil, that the government is like, we have to know who these people are. 
Like we got to be able to track them. Like I thought that played beautifully here because it makes sense. Mm-hmm. Not makes sense, but it makes sense that if this were real, the government would want to get their hands on it a hundred percent and control it. And you know, the public who were scared to death of anything different obviously is going to believe that that mutants are out to get them, which is not the case for everyone. But what do you think about the plot here? Not just the way the themes fit together, but Magneto's master plan here. Can you poke any holes in what it is he wants to do? Um, so I, I think that they had a choice to make. I think um, when you decide to introduce the X-Men, um, it makes perfect sense to start with the Mutant Registration Act because that's the most believable um start for normal people to look at this thing of course the government would want to uh catalog where human where mutants are and of course you can believe stuff like um they would experiment on on mutants like with wolverine um where i feel like they uh, they uh, they copped out a little bit is that they wanted to make magneto into a guy that was against this by any means necessary but they also wanted to make his plan as as nonsensical and comic bookish as possible. Mm. And so his his big master plan is to turn all of the world leaders into mutants because that'll fix it because once they're like us, then they won't stand against us. They'll be on our side. That's kind of flimsy logic, but sure. Um, but I also feel like that's different than you deciding, all right, well, Magneto sees this big meeting of of the world leaders, and all of these are Homo sapiens, as he puts it. <laughs> um, I think, why wouldn't he just kill them? Why did why wouldn't he just kill all of them? Because they're they it doesn't matter if they're mutants or not. They're his. They're 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 the ones that were standing against him in his mind. But I feel like that's too dark of a of a of a scheme for this movie. They wanted to make it as, as, they wanted to make it as ridiculous as possible. So we have this convoluted plan of him using his powers to turn other people into mutants, which we don't, we don't get a real explanation of it. Uh, The brotherhood does really weird science stuff in this movie that we never get any explanation for. Like that black stuff they put in Cerebro that just somehow just hurts Xavier. We don't know what it does to him. It just hurts him. (laughs) It's the, (laughs) It's it's the Spider Man. Uh, it's a, it's it's Venom, the alien symbiote. That's what it is. Yeah, I don't know. It uh, Mystique puts that stuff in in Cerebro, and uh, whatever whatever happens to Professor X, he just falls out of his chair. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and so he recovers later in the movie. Um, but yeah, this, I, this plot is just like you don't really think about it at the time when this movie came out, but like now. When I look at it today, I'm like, that plot kind of doesn't make sense. Like, what? Why let would me, he think that's the solution? Let me play devil's advocate for you. Because here's what I think. I don't know if they're thinking this or not. But what I think is, if he kills all the world leaders, like you suggested, because it would, would make the most sense, doesn't that then make it especially harder on mutants in this country because a mutant did that to them? That's true, but I also think that Magneto doesn't care about that. I don't think he cares at all. I think he, yeah. if 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 his if his point the entire movie is we're starting a war, I'm trying to wipe out the other side before they wipe me out. Mm. Mm, yeah. Plus, what if listen? What if this? <laughs> what if this backfires? And one of these world leaders becomes like Superman or something and like is indestructible and can do anything and can actually defeat you. Yeah, that's why <laughs> that's why I feel like this is flimsy logic, because you're assuming that, all right, now you're going to fly down at the end of the movie when they're all mutants and go, my brothers, we're all on the same side and they're just all going to agree with you. No, just because they're mutants doesn't mean they're all going to agree with you now. Somebody in that crowd is going to go. You did this to us. This is your fault. And they're going to stand against you, even if they're a mutant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You're right. Oh, man. Comic book science at its finest. 
<laughs> yeah, like all the world leaders were going to be like, thank you for giving us this gift, Magneto. Now we're all on the same side. No? Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> You've opened our eyes, Magneto. You've shown yeah. us the way. And and now we know at this point that um, the results of it are unstable and it's probably going to kill people anyway. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, you can make the case at that point that Magneto wouldn't have cared that it would have killed them because either way, it would have it would have served the purpose he wanted it to. But yeah, it's a very convoluted scheme. <laughs> and 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 honestly, what about the contraption that, that they put him in? Like he can manipulate metal. So explain to me how this worked. Yeah, it just <laughs> the the parts of it that spin around and then it creates the big light. Yeah, yeah it just. I don't know. We don't ever get a explanation of how this thing works. Like I said, like the black stuff they put in Cerebro. Um, but it serves the purpose of giving us the big final act and having us a big, having a big glowing disaster for the heroes to stop it in the movies, which we've seen in tons of these movies now. Yeah. Um, and it does give us a, a reason for the team to come together and, and work together to stop it. I think the way that they stop his plan is 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 still works. I think um, throwing Wolverine up there to distract him, and then Cyclops um, waits to take the shot. And, like I think all of that stuff works because they had to work together to beat him. Um, I would have had more issues with this if if it was just Wolverine showing up and scratching or destroying the machine, and that's the end of the movie. Yeah, good call. Yeah, and I th- I think his sacrifice is also very good. Um, I think that, um, I I think we it, we're introduced to him as a loner, and it makes him more endearing by the end of the movie that he makes that sacrifice for Rogue. Um, mm-hmm. even though I've I've trashed this uh Magneto plot, I do think that it set up some good scenes at the end of the movie. Um, <laughs> uh. And, and, and I mean, I don't want to bypass also how good some of this stuff, like I, I just made fun of the Cerebro scene, but Cerebro looks perfect. Um, yeah. All of the, all of the, the school looks perfect. Everything about it, like the introduction to the school of, of Wolverine waking up in the basement and thinking he's in a, in a government facility and then getting upstairs and seeing like, wait a minute, where, where am I? What, there are kids here? What is this? What is this place? Um, and then we get that montage of what the, what the school is and him explaining and we see the kids in class and we see Cyclops training. Um, the Blackbird looks perfect as well. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. I think they nailed like, even like the visual depiction of what Cerebro looks like to uh, professor Xavier when he uses it is good too. Um, they did a, they did a lot of good things like that with Xavier when he, uh, when he looks in uh Senator Kelly's mind and he, and he walks through what he's seeing. I think that scene is really cool too. Yeah, they nail a lot of this, man. You're right. With the with the, the exception of his plot aside, they nail a lot of this. The aesthetics of this look good. The mansion looks great. You're right. The grounds look great. The classes. Uh, the um, yeah. The the overdub of him talking over those scenes. Like it's just oh, it's so good, man. Everything fits perfectly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it in makes a short all of amount it, of time. Yeah, in yeah short it makes all of you it, get a feel. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. It makes all of it look very believable. Um, it, it looks like it jumps off the comic book pages. I mean, again, dude, that's something else you got to nail. You got, you know, Westchester. You got to nail all of that, and it looks so good. Like, yeah, yeah. There's not a whole lot to to complain about here, and I feel like the complaints we've had are you know, small enough that again, this movie's still highly enjoyable. Um, all right. So look, Phil, they put the students or they put the adults, I guess here into, you know, biker suits. <laughs> um, what do you think about Magneto's costume with the helmet? How's it look to you? Uh, I, I, I like it at that time. Um, I think the helmet we get in first class is way better. Um, mm. I think that helmet is perfect. Um, but I have no issue with like his cloak and everything. Um, I think that looks fine. Um, I think that I think the helmet in the movie looked fine when I first saw it. 
But I think yeah. I I think once we saw the the helmet in first class, it's like, oh, this is this is perfect. It's just it's just like when we first when we saw uh, Andrew Garfield in his suit after seeing three boobies of uh Toby suit. We see the the suit in two, and it's like it's it's perfect. The eyes and everything are perfect. Like <laughs> I don't I don't know how you can make this better. And then they somehow made it better. Yeah, they did. Jeez, they so did. Yeah, everything fits. Everything fits. And I love the explanation of the helmet that it's blocking Professor X's powers because otherwise, why would this dude run around with a helmet on his head? Yes. Um, uh, yeah. That's uh, comics accurate too, isn't it? I believe it is. Um, and man, speaking of, that scene, uh, man, Xavier gets some great scenes in this movie. The scene where he's trying to talk him down and he takes control over Toad and, and Sabretooth and he's trying to tell him, like, um, release them. And Magneto turns everybody's guns against him. Such yes. a great scene. It's awesome. And he stops the bullet from going through the cop's head. He's like, I don't think I can stop them all. <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah. No, his his uh his uh one liners as Magneto are fantastic. Like him him coming in contact with uh Wolverine for the first time and he's like, That wonderful melody isn't running through your entire body, is it? Yeah. Oh God, it's so good. And uh he says, My dear boy, who said I was here for you? So good. Yeah, he, he I, I think Ian McKellen just works so great as a villain because he <laughs> there's such a smarminess to him that it's just it's funny, man. Like in X two when he's when he's sitting on a plane and he's and he's talking to Magneto. I mean not the to uh Mystique and they're joking and Rogue looks over him and he's like, Yeah, we love what you did with your hair. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because he asked Pyro, he goes, what's your name? And he tells me, he goes, no. Oh. What's your other name? Right? No, no. One of the best. I laugh at it every time. It's one of the most funny, unintentionally funny movie, scenes in this movie is uh, when Rogue is just like, are you going to kill me? And he's just like, yes. Yeah, the way he says it. Yeah. <laughs> he just said it so cold. Like, Yes. <laughs> Just so matter-of-factly. And then later on when he goes, he goes, he gets that look. He goes, I'm sorry, my dear. And he's like, oh, he's like sheepish with the way his, it comes out. And you're like, wow, it's kind of creepy. And yeah, but like he's cold as ice, this guy too. Yeah, I, I think that that's one of his better monologues in the movie as well. Um, yeah. When he's exp- when he's looking at the Statue of Liberty and he explains like, yeah, America's supposed to be you know, a land of, you know, forgiveness and peace. And she goes, are you going to kill me? And he goes, um, yes. And he goes, because there is no land of tolerance. There is no peace anywhere. Yeah. It's just such a great line. And uh, outside when he's got, you know, got the cops and everything, he said, you, you know, end up in prison with a number burned into your forehead. And he says, he says, you don't know that will happen. He said, well, just kill me and find out. Like, he knows he can't. He knows he won't. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think their dynamic is fantastic. Their, their chess scene at the end of the movie, the plastic prison also looks amazing. It does. Um, I, it gives us one of the best scenes in the second movie of him breaking out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if you can remember back in your head to when you first saw this film. Did you know that they weren't Magneto was not after Wolverine. He was after Rogue. Um, I didn't. I I never put two and two together. They'd be yeah. against uh, after Rogue until after first viewing. Nice um, twist. Because you didn't expect the big monstrosity of a machine that would give Magneto powers to turn people into mutants. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. Uh, because I because I think that the story that feels like they're telling is that uh, Wolverine is at a crossroads. Mm-hmm. And we get that through um, the conversation she, he has with Storm, where Storm is saying, "Well, I picked a side. I've made my I've made my decision. Right? You haven't. You're still trying to straddle the fence." And he even right. says in that, "Well, you know, Magneto has a point. There's a war coming." Yeah. And and you would think a guy that's as gruff as he is and has made himself out to be a loner and what you'd expect the kind of the archetypes of a bad guy to side with Magneto. 
And so yeah, I think that's, that's part of why I thought that he was he was trying to recruit him. I never bought into it as like this big this big mustache swirling scheme for this big uh, machine. I thought he was just trying to recruit him to his side. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I love that that's where they were leading you. And there was a twist and I love the twist. I love the, I love when the twist is not obvious. Cause dude, that's when it's a twist. When the twist is obvious, it's not a twist. And I've seen yeah. plenty of movies where it was supposed to be an aha moment. And I'm like, come on, we all saw that coming, you know? Yeah, I agree. Um, Nobody saw that coming here. Yeah, speaking of, I think um, the first time we see them come after Rogue and we get the car crash scene where he comes flying through the windshield. Still looks great. The way he heals when he gets up still looks really good. Mm -hmm. And he's just like completely no-selling that he just flew through a car car window. And he's like, are you okay? While his whole face is like falling apart and then healing. (laughs) Yeah. And she's freaking out a little bit. Cause she he's just like, Hey, I'm on. talking to you. It's like, he <laughs> just acting like it's just all normal. Yeah. Yeah. God, the one liners in this movie are so good, man. When they're in the statue of Liberty and he's like, uh, what was he? He's tell storm. He says storm fry him or blast him or something. And he's like, that's right. Lightning inside of a metal container. I thought you went, to, I thought you lived at the school. Yeah. What a great line. That's so great. Uh, or, um, <laughs> It's me. How do, you, how do I know that? You're a dick. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When he goes through the metal detector and then he flips him off by retracting two of the claws and leaving the middle one there. Like, <laughs> so good. Yeah. Ah, oh, man. There's another example of Holly Berry just feeling like she doesn't fit. She just comes out and goes, hey, great yeah. line. Great. <laughs> <laughs> just, hey. I'm here, guys. Yeah. God, imagine being as talented as she is and being in a movie this big and kind of going, eh, I don't know if we needed you here. Like, yeah. We're, man. You're just given, like, very little material. It's like, and I I gather that she enjoyed making these movies. Yeah. Um, But, yeah. I just, it's not even just that she was miscast. They just don't really give her any of the regalness that you'd expect from Storm. Yeah. Um, speaking of one-liners, that scene where she's holding Senator Kelly's hand in the end, and she was saying that she was scared, you know, when she could have very easily been a jerk to him, and she chose not to be. She took the high ground. But when he says, I think you have one less human to worry about, I wonder, that has double meaning, right? Because that could yes. mean, right, because he knew he was going to die, or... That, or maybe that, that he realized that he made yes. a mistake. Yes. Which one do you think it is? I, I think it is double meaning. I think he realized that not all mutants are the same. And then I mm. think he also realized too late that he was going to die. Yeah. It's a good team. Yeah. Yeah. He's great. Again, another actor who's not quite as good. Maybe doesn't pull that off as believably. But yeah. Yeah, you have to have like your action movie slash comic book movie trope of naked guy comes out of water. And of course, there are clothes somewhere for him to put on. They're just clothes sitting somewhere for him to put on. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Stan Lee's the hot dog vendor on the beach. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yes. Uh, and I, yeah, this is, that, again, this movie holds up well. still very entertaining. Um, there are some things that I just feel like for the time period, um, we wouldn't have seen as many problems with it then, but 20 years later, it's like, ah, uh, like I said with the plot, like, ah, uh, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> and when Professor X says that mut- that radiation has no effect on mutants, like, because I guess the, the theory is that mutants are already mutated. They've already they're, evolved. They're, sure. But like, so you mean to tell me that like a mutant who has the power of telepathy could withstand a nuclear meltdown, the radiation from it? Are you kidding? Is yeah. that true? Doesn't really hold up. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't really hold up. But I don't lose a lot of sleep over that either. Um, no, no, it's 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 silly comic book stuff. It's um it doesn't it doesn't really hurt the movie, but you could tell at the time um how far they were willing to go with this movie to 
get a certain rating. It's just like what, when I watched back the 90s Spider-Man movie and you realize that nobody in the city of New York shoots guns with bullets because everybody has laser guns because they can't show anybody getting shot or anybody sh- shooting with a real gun on a TV show at that time. And what was this? There's a the Sp- Spider-Man animated series. If you go back and watch oh, it, everybody crazy. has laser guns. Nobody has real guns. You never see anybody actually get punched in the show. Like they they try to steer far away from violence. And I think that's part of some of the, the stuff that feels dated in this movie is that they try to stay far away from going too far with violence or going too far with uh with how dark it is. And I'm of course saying this about a movie where we saw a Holocaust survivor uh <laughs> become a supervillain, which is pretty dark, but his scheme was only allowed to go so far as the point I'm making. And to your point, uh, if you know the GI Joe cartoon from the eighties, like every Joe and every Cobra, their weapons shot lasers, not bullets. Yes. And what's, what's great is the shells are popping out of the machine guns. <laughs> like what did that shell hold exactly? A little tiny laser? <laughs> little balls of light. Little balls of light in the little, little shells of light that turned into laser. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and no one ever got shot except Duke in that GI Joe movie where he almost died. Yes, it took like ten years for one Joe to get shot. It was like the top Joe at the time. GI <laughs> Joe. Oh, dude, listen, I'm a I'm a huge GI Joe fan because it's nostalgia. Is what I grew up with. I got the entire series, all the movies. And it doesn't age well. And it probably didn't. It probably wasn't great then either. But, you know, it's, you know, boy, I can uh, admit it has faults, but I love it. Boy, when you rewatch some of the stuff that we love, a lot of it doesn't age well. Like one of my favorite X-Men um, episodes to watch is uh, the Morlocks episode. There's so much weird stuff in that episode. <laughs> <laughs> Why is this in the show? The, the. The warlock that keeps uh like doing the chant to mess with Wolverine the entire entire time he's down there. The you, you, you keeping me from what's mine, mine, mine. <laughs> <laughs> he gets mad, he's like, You keeping me from what's mine. Right. Or uh oh, covered in scorpions. Works. That's the other chance you do it. Covered in scorpions. And oh that no. series ran covered in scorpions. <laughs> that series ran from ninety two to ninety seven and predates this, of course. Yes, yes. Um, I, oh, I, I've got, I've got one to throw at you, Phil. If that cartoon doesn't happen, does this movie happen? Um, maybe not. I, I, I think that uh, the X Men, of course, are Marvel's flagship character. But for a lot of kids, they discovered X Men through the through the cartoon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. And we got to give. Uh, George Buza, who who did the voice of Beast, he was actually in this film. And let's see. George Buza made a cameo here too, but I could not tell you where who he was in this. Or where he was in this. Um, Kitty Pride does show up in this movie in a very, very quick moment. And, and get recast later in the franchise. Yep. Yep. Jubilee shows up here. Yeah. Also one of those very odd, like random cameos. And the timeline doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense. Uh Colossus is in this movie. Um but not as Colossus. He was in part two, and very disappointingly, I don't think he ever changed, did he? Uh, briefly. He's briefly. in. He's in two. Yeah, he he changes yeah. really briefly. Because uh, remember, he tells X Men. He t- he tells Wolverine, "I can help." And yep. he told and he tells him, "No, just get the kids out of here." He says, "Help them." Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So I was like, "Yes, yeah, Colossus." Because, dude, listen again, Phil. Fantasy casting. Glenn Danzig is Wolverine. Um, Grace, uh, what's her name? Grace Jones as uh, Storm. I think was the was the pick that everybody always had because she was tall, she was strong, she was always in great shape, great yeah. voice. Um, Arnold Schwarzenegger as Colossus. Yes. 
Like that's how everyone cast this movie. Yeah, I, I and I I like the Colossus this in Deadpool. Um, yeah, yeah, it's very good, very good. Yeah, but yeah, we don't get much of Colossus here. <laughs> no, not at all. Um, yeah, like I didn't expect this movie to not have held up, but for me personally, it really, really holds up. Like, um, I'm anxious to do X2 at this point because, yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah. I, I mean, X2, in my opinion, is one of the best comic book movies of all time. Uh, you don't get much better than the opening of X2. It's one of the, one of the best scenes in any comic book movie. Totally agree. God, man, I can't wait to do it. Um, well, kids, that, that there, uh, even though we could keep gushing about it for another hour and a half, but that there is the first X Men film. Um, you know, one-liners are plenty. The characters are great together. The actors are great together. There's a reason why people are not tired of seeing these actors in these roles because they are so great in them. Um, we didn't touch much on the director and his issues. We've covered mm. Superman Returns here and talked a little bit about said director's issues. Uh, you know, it is what it is. I don't want to dismiss it as that, but you know. Um, yeah, a lot of nonsense there, but, uh, Phil, if you, if you, and I, I don't, you don't have to cast anybody. It, it is what it is. We talked a little bit about that here, but what, what is your personal hope and expectation for an X-Men franchise set in the MCU moving forward? What is, what is that you want to see? They either they haven't done or, or or something that you would like to see them do with the franchise now. Um. Yeah, I would love to see them just do something based around the original five. I think that we got a franchise where Wolverine was the big star, and I think you could take Wolverine off the shelf for a while. They've done so much with that character. I don't know if you can give him a better swan tongue than Logan. And I think you're going to get a nice uh, crossover with him and, and Deadpool. And I think that's a great way to kind of wrap up Hugh Jackman's, Hugh Jackman's time as a character. And because of that, I think you could put that character on a shelf for a while and not recast him right away. Um, I think it's more important at this point to get the original five and Xavier right the first time around. And I would go with a, a different villain than Magneto the first time around as well. Like I... I know the temptation is to go Magneto straight out the gate, but I would try to introduce a new X-Men villain that we haven't seen yet. Uh, Mr. Sinister, maybe? Uh, yeah, you could do Sinister. You could do like a real depiction of the, the Sentinels. You could do um, you know, just a few routes you can go with the first movie. Um but I wouldn't go Magneto right away because we've seen Magneto so many times. I think if they want to get people interested in this, they've got to do something completely new. Um, man, a part of me wants to see a very weird X-Men movie where they end up on Krakoa or they end up in Mojo's um, <laughs> world. Like that would be kind of cool. Like seeing Mojo on, on in a movie would be interesting just to see how they pull it off. Uh, Genosha, right? Yeah, get to see Genosha. I just want to see all of these things from X Men lore that we haven't seen. Like, um, I don't know, introduce characters we haven't really seen. It, I haven't seen them used or given a prominent role. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Um, I'm anxious to see what they do with it and maybe tease Wolverine in the end of the first X Men film, but you still don't reveal anything for a while. Yeah, I, I think you could go a while before we get uh, Wolverine. I think it. I think it would be nice if we got just the original five, yeah. um, or at least like build a team with like some semblance to the original five and just kind of build around that. I mean, because we haven't really seen a good Angel in in any of the X, in X Men movies yet. Like we've seen two guys get cast as Angel, but we haven't seen like what makes Angel interesting as a character. Um, I don't think I think Kelsey Grammer was good casting as Beast, but I don't think we've had a great Beast yet. That's fair. I definitely That's don't fair. think we've had a really good Iceman yet. Like I think there's stuff you could do 
if you just like go with the first class, which they've already used that name. So now you can't even use that name. Um, <laughs> but I, I do think like that comic book they they debuted a few years ago called First Class that was about the original five. Um, there's stuff you can take from that. There's there's I don't know. Um, I, I want them to do. I want them to not try to do stuff that they've done before. Like don't try to do the Dark Phoenix saga again. You've already you've already botched it twice yes <laughs> well they have bought they haven't botched it twice fox botched it twice so don't don't yeah. just rush to try and do it again yeah leave it alone you're right i'm with you i think to do something different maybe, maybe do um, the brood like do get intergalactic oh, stuff i love the brood i love the brood i think the brood's a great idea introduce the shiar do something else like yeah i mean they did bring shiar in in the dark phoenix movie but we don't have to talk about that no we're not going to talk about that uh, um <laughs> yeah yeah i love the bird idea i love the bird idea um well kids we did everything but talk about chris claremont here uh which was probably a huge crime against nature that we didn't do that yeah. um because Phil, you got to give credit where credit's due. None of these movies happen without fantastic source material to draw from. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, to to your point about the '90s show, none of that none of that becomes what it is without Jim Lee drawing those those um, costumes. Because that's like probably like the most popular depiction of the X Men. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one hundred percent. A big part of that happened in the Claremont run too, so. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, kids, uh, we love the films. Go read the comics. Cause you know, again, like we, like we just said, I don't know if we give those comics a, enough of a shout out. So I'm going to do it here as we close the show. So by all means, go read you some Chris Claremont, um, uh, X-Men books. And there's a lot to choose from. Trust me. Yeah. Phil, let's, uh, let's try to wrap this up. My friend, if you can, See if you can sum this up and give me your last word on the X-Men film. Uh, I think when we think about comic book movies sometimes, I think we want to immediately go, oh, it has to, it has to, it has to get me excited in the same way that the source material did. And it's, it's a tough act to do because there's so much source material for X-Men. Um, and it'd be hard to try and, and center this movie on any era of X-Men. There's just too much stuff out there. Uh, mm-hmm. But I think this movie does a great job of introducing uh, pop culture to these characters outside the cartoon. And you can't discount how influential this movie was. Um, if this movie didn't exist and it wasn't successful, like I said, there would not be a decade of, of comic book movies afterwards that were everything that we wanted and more. Yeah, I agree. Dude, 100%. I mean, I, I'm so happy with this movie. I'm happy with so much of the way a lot of this stuff has turned out. I mean, it's, you know, again, kids, you don't get any of this without the comics. Um, and you don't get any of this without, listen, without us, without you, without the fans continuing to buy these comics over the years. I mean, if Marvel had stopped publication 20 years ago, do we get anything now? I don't, maybe. But like, you know, again... Got to give the books a major shout out here. We don't get any of this stuff. So um, by the time you folks listen to this, we may have already recorded uh, X2, but you can be guaranteed we're going to. Don't count on X3. I can't say that we'll do it. Of course, we've done Justice League here, Phil. We could do anything after that. Yeah. We even did uh, the Snyder Cut here, for God's sake, Phil. Yeah. If you if you want to listen to me be very negative about a movie for about an hour and some change, then X3, sure. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> or go back in the in the, the archives and check out our DC related material and then you might hear some stuff you don't want to hear. Listen, I I this is I'm sure you've listened if you go back and listen to our episodes where we talk about Star Wars and I am even forgiving about the prequel trilogy. Uh-huh. I am not nearly as forgiving of X-Men 3. Yeah, well. And you know, you shouldn't be because yikes. Brett Ratner is all I can say. Yeah. Oof. Hey, Brett, you done effed up, Brett. 
<laughs> like, I don't tell you. Yeah, it's, it's still <laughs> wild to think about the singer decided, I don't want to do this. I want to go make Superman Returns. And they didn't want to wait for him to come back. And because of that, we got two not great movies out of this. We, <laughs> we got two movies that were kind of duds out of this. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you done messed up. You done messed up, A.A. Hey, hey, Ron. That's just a jump in my head. You done messed up, Brett Ratner. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, we're going to focus on the positive. We're going we're gonna to end on the positive note. This movie's fantastic. Go out of your way to watch it again. And again, and over and over, it seems, as much as you can. Because, God, it's good. It's so good. And uh, it laid the groundwork. That I, to this day, I don't know if we all appreciate as fanboys the great work this movie did in laying the foundation of what was to come. And before there was an MCU, there was an X Men universe. And man, it's so worth your time, kids. And I know that if you're, if you're comic book fans, you've already seen these movies, but for God's sake, go back and see that again and peruse the archives for related material as well. Because I assure you, if it's not there now, it will be soon. I promise you that. And we'll see what happens in the future with the MCU version. And hopefully they nail that as well. But in the meantime, that is X-Men. Hey, thanks for listening to the show. Check out our social media on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at 6 Podcast. We'll see you next time.